welcome everybody to um, tonight's event where um, myself uh, I'm joined with Paul Shuttup from the University of Durham, Louise Turun, who is a lived experience um, of chronic pain, um, uh, Chris Penlington, clinical psychologist at the University of Newcastle, who's working um, with uh, people with pain, predominantly facial and dental pain, and uh, Balbir Singh, who's from the Balbir um, sing dance company and we're presenting to you tonight a multifaceted approach to actually how we might address managing pain in 2021 and beyond and how we need to think about it and work with it differently so it's quite an interesting exciting event we've got a lot of things to share with you um, and um, please join the ride. It's going to be interactive at times and we'll be asking you to participate in different ways. Uh, and we will have a couple of breaks um, so that you can um, uh, uh, pace it. So let me just start by sharing the screen. Okay, great news. So, um, first thing I want to do on behalf of all of us who come together fairly quickly um, for this event is to make sure that you've got a really good idea about the Sorry, issue we're dealing with. Sorry, Francis, do you want to make it full screen? Um, I can do. Just for us with dodgy eyes on. Yeah, no fair dues. They do. Okay. The first, great, great, Paul. So thanks for that one. Um, so the first thing we need to get across to you is actually what we're talking about when we're talking about chronic pain. And it's pretty straightforward. It's a pain in any part of the body or pains in any part of the body that have been around for at least three months or more. That's the definition recently revised again in 2020. Um, what we have to get our heads around is it's a huge problem. It's an epidemic that quietly goes on in the background day in day out um, for and has has gradually worsened over the last 20 years I've been working in the area 30 years now and all I can say is there's loads of pain and there's more pain than there's ever been um, it's quite clear from all the evidence that's emerging about the data on it, there's more people with it, it's spreading across the age groups and there's a huge problem with chronic pain in older people. So we've got at least 28 million people in the UK and a recent report that came out just in the last few months is saying that in England alone, there are at least 15 and a half million people with pain. And as you can see carefully at this slide is that actually affects all age groups. And the really worrying trend for somebody like myself, who's been involved in this area for such a long time, is the younger age group now are having more pain. So the more people in younger age groups than there ever been before, women have always been more affected than men. That's been a longstanding um, perspective. Um, so a lot of it about affecting all age groups um, and it's growing. So it's good business to be in if you're in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, when we're looking at understanding pain, we're trying to understand actually the way it impacts on a population or on an individual or on a particular group. And one of the things we're quite clear about now is that in England, 12% of the population have a severe impact on pain, that it severely limits their daily functioning, their health functioning, emotionally, physically and socially. That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. And the other thing just to highlight, particularly of note to the northeast of England, is actually it's much commoner in areas of deprivation. And that's been a long term trend. Again, more women than men. OK, so if we're going to understand pain, we need to understand the bigger picture. 
because when people have pain, they spend most of the time guiding us to just focus on the pain and doing something to try and sort it out and fix it. But actually the, the reality is that in persistent or chronic pain, that's actually not that easy. If at this present time, not 100% possible, but change is possible. And change is possible because if you understand the what before the how we might address managing pain, then actually that helps make sense. So here we've got a pain cycle, which shows that actually pain is affecting the person physically in a whole series of areas. It's affecting their sleep, it's affecting their moods, so they're much more stressed and frustrated and fearful. They're actually having changes in um, actually their, their body themselves, not only is it weaker, but actually they often are gaining weight. Um, that in sense might actually lead to them see that actually they've changed their sense of self, their identity of self has changed, and they have much more patterns of negative thinking with depressive mood swings. And in the middle of all of this, this impacts on their social life, their relationships and their future. And so it's not surprising um, they have time off work, um, have money worries. And so we have this cycle. Now, all those areas on that cycle have the uh, have the potential for change. And the least changeable one is actually the persistent pain itself. So what we need to get our head around in this world right now is it's never been better to really get to grips with the fact that we now understand why pain actually persists. It's actually the result of a dysfunctional malfunction of the way the brain is interpreting the sensors and the signal system that operates within the body. And it becomes much more sensitive and overreactive to incoming messages from different parts of the body, including some of the pain areas. And the brain interprets this as a threat. And when the brain interprets any external experience coming into the body and within the body as a threat, it highlights the message, the experience of pain. So we now understand that that's also influenced by the way we think about our pain, our past and present life experiences, our memories that the brain has encoded within it about pain, how our moods are at the moment that we are experiencing changes in pain, our sleep our patterns very much influence pain as well as our genetics and our focus of attention. And in the middle of all of this, the neural networks themselves and the sensors are much more sensitive. We know this, and when you know this, you can use this information to enable people to understand their pain. And the evidence is showing that if they understand their pain, they can then start to move into taking control and being more confident in self-management. Because the current situation is that we have an opioid epidemic, both in this country and particularly in the US, which is causing more problems rather than less. And we still have way more pain. This is just to say that there is an updated version or definition of, um, of pain that came out last year. And it's basically saying, as it's always done, it's an unpleasant sensory emotional experience that is associated or resembles that associated with some sort of damage to tissues. But when we have chronic pain, those areas are actually healed. So what's important to take away from this is that pain is always a personal experience and that report must be respected and accepted as that individual's experience. And that's really important if we're going to engage people in helping them to be more confident to manage their pain. 
How do we change the impact? Well, that's how we start to move into the world of self-care focus. Because what people need, as I've already demonstrated, is more knowledge, just even the knowledge about understanding pain and their brain and how that all connects with their experience can make a huge shift and difference. So they need more skills and tools and resources so that actually they can make a difference to their health and well-being and that happens by helping them to engage in this self-care cycle where you can see there's a range of options that they can work with people who can support their self-manage and and take a greater charge of their day and their life and their sense of self and be the person that they can be even if they have to live with their pain, um, they can live well with it. So we're going to now, um, having set the scene a little bit there, um, touch base with a couple of things at this point. Um, I'm just going to step aside and just check with Paul um, about the poll questions. Um, have we had any responses, Paul, in the chat to the poll questions, Chris? Um, any responses to those at all? Have you seen in the chat the poll questions? Yep. So the first question yep. is in the chat. So what percent of people over 18 years old in the UK have chronic pain in 2017 and a health survey for England? So we gave you a few options there of 12, 7, 22 and 34%. And I think we've had a few responses uh, in that have come up with 34%, which is good. Yep. Yeah, so we've got a few few responses on that one. Great, and actually 34% is the um, right, right um, answer. So well done for those who of you who were listening in um, as I was sharing things, but it just highlights what a big problem um, it is. Okay, that's great. So then um, we're going to move into a little bit more to try and help us to actually really be within the experience that people who have pain have. And this is where Louise um, and myself are going to um, work together a little bit more, um, really around this issue about actually how the pain took over Louise and she's going to share that and then we're going to explore actually how self-management um, can be taken forward. In order to do that, in the complexity of modern world, I'm about to swap to a different slide set. So bear with me while we do that and if anybody wants to put any questions in the chat while I do that, we can take one. Okay. Right. Okay. So, um, any questions, Paul, for us to pick up on at this point? If not, then we can hold on to it. And Louise, can I how hand over to you to share with us? Yes. Thanks, Francis, and good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm going to whistle through my story a little because I've got quite a few slides to, to show, which I think will sort of highlight um, what, what journey I was on. Um, so I'm, I'm bringing everyone into the story here after I've already been on opioids for 14 years. Um, and that was for pain from um, my fibromyalgia, which I believe I, I, I had since I was a young girl, or at least the, 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 the symptoms I had from when I was young. Um, I was a sickly child, didn't take part in sport, all this kind of thing, um, and had what the doctor told me at the time was just growing pains, um, and they'd go away, he told my mother, but they never did. Um, so anyway, um, over the period of years, my uh, health started to deteriorate, um, I was taking more and more time off work. Um, uh, for this pain, arthritis as well started to, to factor in. Um, frequent trips to the doctor for one infection or another um, and, and then I ended up being put on some heavy duty uh, painkillers 
And uh, we started off with codeine. Um, that really didn't have much of an effect. I wasn't able to get up and go to work the next day. So uh, we swiftly moved on to um, the, what was then the old MST. Um, but then after, after the, the new drug was introduced to the GP practice, I was persuaded that um, OxyContin was the new drug of choice <laughs> um, and to, to come on to this. So uh, off we go. And again, over the ensuing years, um, the, the dose needed to be increased and increased and increased. So here we are coming in um, and I gradually put on more and more weight, got less and less active, more and more pain. Um, uh, and yeah, was, was just in a, in a pretty sorry state. Can I have the next slide, please, Francis? Um, so yeah, my life basically started to revolve around my armchair, um, which, you know, I was quite thrilled at the time to be able to get myself a nice recliner. Um, and, you know, my children at the time took the mickey and said, oh, you know, mum, that's what, that's what old ladies have. You know, and they were right, they were quite, quite right, because at the time I, I was early 40s, um, and here I was already living the life of, of, of an older lady, um, which of course now nobody should live that life, but this was what they thought. And everything I did revolved around being in, in being seated. Um, and recently someone else um, coined that stage as my sofa stage. And I think that was, that's quite, quite right. Um, everyone would come and visit me. And as you can see here, as one of my grandchildren come to visit, but I didn't leave that chair. I didn't get down on the floor to play. Um, pain was too bad for that. And you can also see, interestingly, in this slide, um, if you notice my arm, my arm is covered in lesions. Now, these weird lesions were over my arms, legs, um, in my groin, everywhere. Um, and I was told at the time it was a, a skin condition called hydrodenitis suprativa. Uh, whether it actually was or not, I do not know, um, because a lot of this cleared up later. Next slide, please, Francis. Um, so again, just just shows you know an, another another slide where my um, my birthday is being celebrated there um, at my daughter's house, and and I'm sat. And you can see in this picture, I'm even bigger again. Um, when I look back at these pictures, you know I'm horrified. And it's it, it's important to mention here as well that I was doing everything I could to lose the weight. And of course, every appointment I went to, that was what was focused upon. Well, Louise, you need to lose weight. Yeah. I was trying, I was counting calories, I was doing all sorts of things um, and nothing ever worked, nothing ever worked. And I wasn't stuffing my face with fast food or junk food or any of this thing, nothing worked. And it was getting me more and more depressed. I just wasn't taking part in family life at all. Um, next slide please, Francis. Yeah, so, and, and again here, again at my daughter's house, um, and those were my only trips, really, if I recall, either that or to the to the doctors or the hospital um, for tests. And, um, you know, that that was it. That was as, as much as I did. I got to the point where I wouldn't take phone calls um, from anybody, including family. Um, the grandchildren would call me up on FaceTime and I would fall asleep. And Karen, my wife, would be sat next to me, nudging me so that I, I could get back into the conversation. Fortunately, my young grandchildren didn't really notice that this happened. Um, but, you know, how sad is that, really, that I was dozing off in a conversation with my grandchildren? It, it was quite heartbreaking, really. Um, and, you know, I wasn't able to... Here, I've got a kitten on my lap, but my own cats, I couldn't tolerate them walking across my lap. It was too painful, way too painful. Um, I couldn't have noise in the house because it, it, that was painful. Um, so the telly was always kept low. There was no music um, and people stopped visiting. Family stopped asking me to event or asking us because this affected my wife too. Um, stopped asking us, inviting us to events because the answer was always no or, well, I'll have to let you know on the day because I can't plan. Next slide, please, Francis. Anyway, this, it, that was it. it. It just got worse and worse. And it, it culminated in me going back to the GP just over, I suppose, four and a half years, maybe cracking on towards five years now, uh, for another increase. Um, and fortunately for me, 
he'd reached the ceiling of what he could prescribe, so had to refer me to pain clinic. Um, when eventually I got the appointment through, which luckily at the time wasn't that long, uh, I met a wonderful clinical nurse specialist who at the time I hated her because she started to suggest that the problem actually wasn't my condition, which I believed was worsening. Um, it was actually due to the um, long-term use of opioid pain meds. Um, and to back this up, she would show me the page on the Faculty of Pain Meds Opioids Aware, where it was written in black and white, and I really couldn't argue. Um, and I, I remember initially, I always took my wife to appointments, which I think is an, an important thing to pass on. I think that's really important because back at that time, I wouldn't retain any information. Um, and it was up to my wife to keep prompting me after appointments to you know, put the computer in front of me and say, read this. And I would have that opioids wear page again and read it, the, the side effects. I think I had every side effect on that list. Um, and so the nurse started teaching me alternative coping strategies and suggested that actually life could be better if I reduced or even stopped the pain meds. What a horrifying thought, don't be so ridiculous. I'm on these pain meds for the excruciating pain I'm in. What am I gonna be like if I stop them? But between a couple of appointments, I suffered two emergency admissions to hospital for opioid induced impaction. And for anyone that doesn't know what that means, I couldn't go to the toilet despite being taking stuff to prevent this happening. Um, I went all weekend twice without being able to go and having various different healthcare professionals coming in to see me um, and culminating in an ambulance to hospital on the Monday twice and ending up in surgery twice. Um, and I was informed in theatre that actually this is a common event for people that are on um, opioids and that, you know, I shouldn't be embarrassed. Well, I was. I wanted to crawl under a stone and, and die. And I decided there and then enough was enough. And I would go for it and try and get off these drugs before they killed me. So this is where self-management started to play a part. And I started to think, do you know, I think the actual idea that life could be better is worth exploring because right now I didn't think it could get any worse. Could I have the next slide, please, Francis? Um, so I was, I, I now feel I was really quite lucky um, in the fact that I, because of those two emergency admissions, it gave the hospital the criteria to admit me to um, community hospital here in, in, in Devon for rapid taper. Um, and I knew I was going to be the first person that they'd done this with. Um, and I was happy to be that guinea pig. Um, and the, the staff at the community hospital had never done this before. It was all a new journey for all of us. Um, and I remember going in on the, on, the, um, on, the, on the first day full of fear and excitement, fear of what it would actually be like, fear of what coming off the drugs would be like, but excitement at the possibility that this could be the turn in the road. Um, next slide, please, Francis. Yeah, so we've skipped on a little here, but, but um, suffice to say, I was in hospital a week and um, on the first night, the consultant slashed the opioids by half. And on the third night, he did the same. And the key sentence he said to me was that when the withdrawal kicked in, um, pace the ward because that will kick off your endorphins, the body's natural painkiller. I'd never heard that before. Um, and it really resonated. And so when the withdrawal effects started to kick in, they did give me a drug um, to counteract the worst of it. Um, I would pace up and down the ward with headphones in, listening to music. Uh, and I would just go backwards and forth um, all the time. And it worked, it really, really helped. And I went from 25 steps the day I went into hospital, which would have been from my bed to the toilet, to the armchair and back again. I had a pedometer to record this. I think I've got a photograph of it somewhere. To on the second day in hospital, um, 2000 steps. And the consultant had to ask me to slow down a little because he was afraid that I was really going to overdo it and shock. You know, my body would be a bit shocked. Um, but it was fine. And I carried on walking and I haven't stopped to this day. 
And one of the first places we went was to Timmouth Seafront where this picture is. Initially with my wheelie walker, which I had at the time. Um, and gradually over time, I went from wheelie walker, walking poles to nothing at all. Next slide, please, Francis. Uh, we would go out every single day, no matter what the weather, we brought us, this is me and my wife, because um, she was my full-time carer. So she still came out with me all the time. Uh, we bought ourselves the appropriate gear, um, waterproof trousers, waterproof coat, shoes, all the stuff. Um, and we would go out, whatever the weather, obviously we wouldn't go, <laughs> go out in a storm, but you know, the rain wasn't gonna stop us. Um, and, and we kept going. Next slide, please, Francis. Uh, this one, this one particularly sticks in my mind because one thing we did do, obviously in the beginning, when you start activity after such a long period of time not being active, you can only do short bags. Um, so we would pack our bags, we bought ourselves decent rucksacks and uh, flask. Karen would carry all this initially because I couldn't tolerate any weight in the beginning. We would take a flask, we would take snacks, we would take everything we needed to be able to sit down outside, whatever the weather, and take plenty of breaks. And this was on one of those occasions. Um, there were some very friendly cows in this field and they took a great interest in what we were doing sitting on the tree stump, having a cup of coffee. <laughs> Next slide, please. Uh, and we would stop, we would go on coast paths and we would get some very funny looks because we'd have our rucksacks and, and all our gear and people, walkers would come by with just their dog and nothing else and say, oh, how far have you come? Thinking we were doing the coast path. Uh, and we'd say, oh, only from the car park, <laughs> because we had all our stuff for these, you know, be able to sit. Uh, and it, it, connecting actively with nature, we found helped both of us. Um, you had the, uh, the fresh air, um, the freedom of being out, um, you know, our, both of our moods improved. I was sleeping through the night. Um, pretty much from when I came out of hospital, to be frank, uh, it was just fantastic. I felt as if someone had flicked a switch and turned me on. I feel like I slept through my forties. I feel like I missed um, over a decade of my life. I still now will have arguments with the family about something they say happened and I have no recollection of it at all. I've lost big chunks of time. Um, but instead of dwelling on that, I've tried to concentrate on trying to learn as much as possible and help others. Next slide, please, Francis. This was a particularly great occasion for me because um, where I live in South Devon, this is Haytor Rocks. Um, and uh, it, it's the first time I've managed to go up there in years. And this, I was so ecstatic when I got to the top, that's where those, that photograph was taken to sort of celebrate that. Um, so for, for me personally, it was huge. I hadn't been up there since the kids were small. Next slide, please. Another great first. Um, I hadn't dipped my feet in the sea for years. Um, I'd had surgery on, my, on both my feet due to um, my toe joints um, crumbling, I'd been told at the time. Um, <laughs> and so I had some operations on them. And so it was uncomfortable to walk bare feet, um, especially during the time I was on the opioids because everything was oversensitive. Um, but this was a particularly great time being able to paddle for the first time in years. Um, and, you know, I found I was losing weight quite rapidly, um, walking every day, getting fitter. And yeah, it really brought home that idea of natural painkillers um, because my pain was, was under control. I wouldn't say it had gone because it was sort of evident when I did sit and, and rest for too long. Um, but certainly, certainly under control for the first time in years. Next slide, please. Uh, another one just just showing you. I think you can see the difference in these slides to the beginning where, you know, I'm smiling, I'm thinner. Um, I've got bright pink hair now. <laughs> Um, because I, I feel like I'm alive um, and, and this is one of my favourite places to be anywhere on the coast path. Next slide. Uh, again, just another more of the same really, out in all weathers, just enjoying being out in nature. Um, yeah, nothing really more I can say about that one. Next one, Francis. 
And this is a new one. So yeah, since um, September 2020, during the, the lockdown, when we were first allowed back out again, um, we decided to join some friends here in Torquay and see if we could actually swim in the sea with them. And we really quite enjoyed it. And they were going to do it all year round. So we thought, let's see, let's see if, um, if we can do the same. I hadn't been swimming in over 20 years um, uh, for, for many reasons, mostly because I was ashamed of how, how fat I was. Um, and I really didn't have the energy or, you know, it, it, I just wouldn't, I just wouldn't have done it. And I found that by getting in the sea last year, the, the pain relief and, and buzz from it was just amazing. Um, and so we've been doing it ever since. Um, and there is a whole community of people that we meet on the seawall. And some of the people we meet are, are in their 90s and still going down and dipping in the sea every day. And they put down their, their health and, and longevity to get. But um, I would recommend you look into it. Um, have I another one, Francis? Yes, one more, I believe. There you are. Thank you for listening. If there's anything you think I've missed, Francis, that's important, tell me. You're mute. I think what you've just shared with us is a journey of joy. And it's a journey of joy that came as a result of a crucial period of time where you actually listened and took on board the possibility of a different journey. And I think that's what's really important. And the other thing just to add that we've been watching actually how Louise has retrained her brain to be less sensitive and more in the moment and the time she is with the body which she is moving and sharing with the brain that actually it's okay and there isn't a threat that you think there is and there isn't the sensitivity that you've wound up um, that you think there is and so gradually gradually that sensitivity has wound down and um, Louise is having less pain I think the journey also shows the tragedy of just using one approach to managing pain given the evidence that we now know today of the impact of opioids um, it's a huge journey um, and all, all I personally can say is um, well done Louise and um, her wife Karen in taking that journey. Can so, I add one more thing Francis before yeah, we move absolutely, on? Yeah absolutely. I just wanted to add as well that before when I went into hospital I was on a complete polypharmacy of, of drugs you know, I was on two antidepressants. I was on um, um, diazepam for one thing or another. I was on a, a whole bag full of drugs that I had from the chemist for treating um, one problem or another that had cropped up during those years on opioids. And gradually, after I came off the opioids, each one fell away. And now I'm tapering the last antidepressant because they were they are quite tricky to, to do. Um, and then I'll be off all my drugs completely. I, I, I think this is actually something really, really important as somebody who's worked with people for many years, actually this experience of people no longer relying on the drugs and gradually, gradually shrinking them from their lives and growing their self sense of self and self identity um, and building joy and enjoyment and reducing fear and better sleep and all the rest can make a huge difference. And the science is actually saying that's what we need to do. The challenge is that actually it's a huge area of numbers of people that needs to be addressed. So there has to be investment, not in 500 million pounds worth of opioids, but actually in the, in the self-management world, um, in the knowledge, skills, tools and resources. So we're just going to share Louise and I a little bit more um, at this point um, about that, and then we'll be taking a break. Um, just share the screen a little bit more. So exploring a little bit more because most of the care for people with pain in this country, in the UK, 
k is actually in primary care. It's actually with GPs and pharmacists and nurses, your first port of call um, when you have health issues, pain issues in the health service. And um, Chris, I gather you're back in the um, in 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 the um, uh, event tonight. Do you want to just comment um, on this slide about why self management would help? Can I um, hand that over to you? Okay, yes, me, apologies, Francis. because oh, I sorry, am having Francis. a few computer problems, so I'm speaking from my phone, but hopefully this is still okay. It's fine, it's fine. Great. Um, so, yeah, so I think it's all about what people believe, and people talk to me. I've been doing some research interviews lately, and so many people, when they're talking to me about self-management and about persistent pain, they're saying, like, how could something so small makes so much difference and I think this is why a lot of people just can hardly believe because we tend to believe that pain is mainly due to physical causes and if we do believe that if that's our belief that pain is due to physical causes and like myself most people have probably been brought up in, in that belief then it follows from that belief that self-management can be nothing more than just the icing on the cake and therefore it won't make much of a difference. And I think this is a dominant view that a lot of us share until we look at the science, until we understand the science. And actually one of the really important things that we need to do for self-management is to actually shift that belief to a belief that pain is an output of the brain and is influenced by many things. And we certainly have the science now that does back that up. And we have the example of um, many people having experiences like Louise as well. As soon as we believe that, it opens up the possibility that self-management as a lifestyle change is one of the most important methods of managing pain. And you've got outcome data that shows that as well. You've got lots and lots of studies that show self-management is at least as effective as drugs or operations in persistent pain. And that's when people aren't necessarily believing the power that it can have. It can get even better when you've got that belief. Um, as long as we believe it can make the difference, then it can make the significant difference. But we're never going to get that if we're stuck in this belief that pain is due only to physical causes. I don't, I don't know if you're on mute or if I've just lost you. No, um, no, I was on mute. Um, and um, <coughs> uh, but, but absolutely, the, the point here is that there needs to be a shift, both in understanding the neuroscience and a shift in the beliefs, because they are out of touch. And by making that shift, um, we can bring in self-management um, to be an important component in the management of pain. So I'm just going to take the slides on a little bit more just to share with you um, some things um, which I think are important. And I think already um, the point's been made by Louise. It's about actually how in we're taking care of ourselves. So we move from being enduring to enjoying life. And that's a really important perspective that Louise has just shared. And that for clinicians particularly, and now another group that is joining the workforce to help people manage pain and long-term conditions, social prescribers, it, 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 what is crucial is the listening and the walking with the person rather than the immediate rush to find another drug or another referral to another service. You heard how long it took Louise to get to self-management and in my experience over the last 30 years the average time to get to self-management with people who have the expertise to guide that behavioral change is seven years. So it's changing the impact of pain and the doing that is basically ensuring people have accurate trusted knowledge the skills sometimes they've got some of those skills already but didn't realize they needed to use them and sometimes they need some new ones and they need resources and tools that are trusted and have been used by other people with pain and actually have an evidence base behind them and that's what the self-care cycle is showing here
Um, I'll skip that slide, um, but practically day to day, it is about helping people to have a shift in their sense of self-identity, which is much more positive, um, so they can engage um, in life and their health and well-being. But fundamentally, the block probably here lies here, that the clinicians and social prescribers do not have the confidence in communicating in two areas. First of all, the latest neuroscience about chronic pain, and most GPs and pharmacists in particular just do not have the right person-centered model with the neuroscience updated within that. And they don't have the sorts of skills that they can guide conversations so that they can help people from stopping the endless search to try and find and fix this pain problem to actually help me to manage me and my life and my pain. Um, and there needs to be a whole series of other skills, particularly in safe use of medicines and engage not only the individual themselves with pain, but their carers. So as a result of this in 2018, the recognition that actually we need not to focus on more drugs. We need not to focus on the neuroscience. We need not to focus actually on the patient. We need to focus on the clinician meant that we delivered, developed a live well with pain web-based resource, particularly for clinicians. And to date, we have had over 100,000 contacts in three years. It's designed to be usable within a short space of a consultation time of a GP in the UK health system. Um, it's designed literally to be integrated within their GP computing systems if they would want that, but it's particularly designed to enable information to be from the website that can guide the patient in thinking and pondering about the journey, um, being linked by obviously the current methods that we do this um, with email, text uh, or printed copies. And recently we've added Google Translate as an option. So a lot of the pages both on this and the sister website, which is for people with pain, can now be translated into many other languages. So that's good news. The resources for people with pain are boring. They've got lots of words. And most people with pain, as you heard from Louise, struggle with concentration, memory problems, and often may fall asleep while trying to read through a particular leaflet. So they've been designed to be more engaging. They've been the resources have been designed to share with people with pain in different formats, including um, videos, podcasts, and so on. So they are quality valued resources that engage people to start to think and ponder so that they can make a shift to taking action that leads to them to having a more joyful life. The My Live Well With Pain website emerged in 2019 and covers the whole series of areas that you've seen on the self-care cycle. And then in 2020, Paul is going to share after we've had with the after the break um, about how we've implemented a particular tool designed specifically for primary care, which is a 10 steps program which means that actually in one place, there is the possibility to engage in 10 steps that can help the person move into self-management and keep dipping back into those resources um, and um, um, behavioral changes. What's important about these 10 steps is that actually the clinicians need to learn them so that they can then use them with the patients who also have exactly the ten, same 10 steps um, footsteps program. It's so important that both clinicians and patients share the common hymn sheet, the same information and resources. Um, and with the clinicians learning from their 10 footsteps program, how to um, know more about them and learn the skills on how to implement them with the patient. 
footstep one, for example, here is about helping people to make sense of the pain in the brain, but also it's about helping the clinicians do exactly the same thing. So they can have a very sensible conversation where they ha have the same knowledge um, and information to talk about and explore. Um, the thing that we know from using this type of approach, um, which is fundamental, and you heard from Louise, is that once she was given the opportunity to see a different journey, the crucial thing for clinicians in particular is it's the person's plan for their life. It's not the clinicians, because the clinicians tend to have one plan for that person, and that's drugs or referral. But actually, there needs to be this bigger dimension and that the journey is always going to be up and down because that's the reality. But if you've got the right resources and safe prescribing, there can be better journeys for more people. We had three questions roughly during, during the, that session. I think uh, Louise has answered Anne's question regarding the benefits of exercise very mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. comprehensively, I think. Uh, in terms of uh, the benefits of, of exercise and being active in terms of managing manage your pain. Louise, do you want to say a couple of? Yeah, and there's a couple of things as well I want to add there. Firstly, um, as Francis has pointed out, it doesn't necessarily have to be walking. Um, it can be, you know, whatever. We've got a friend um, that comes with us and she's in a, um, a motorised wheelchair. She still calls it walking. Um, and for her, getting out and active in nature is, is just as important as it is for me with walking. So it doesn't necessarily have to be walking. And I think I would suggest it's any activity that you enjoy doing and feel you can repeat. Um, and there was something else I was going to add to that, Paul, and I've forgotten what it was. Now. <laughs> Sorry. Not, not, not to worry, perhaps pop it in the chat. Yeah. That actually, um, Irene asked a question because she has, unfortunately, she has uh, a crumbling toe joint problem and obviously that negates a little bit on the on the walking side but there are certainly other other activities mm. that you know that that, that she you know, Irene could do basically to help with this and I think there was a couple of other guys chipped in regarding swimming and uh, the effects of cold water and the benefits of cold water and I think we've had this discussion before and actually in previous <laughs> previous meetings uh about this and uh, yeah, the benefits of swimming. I mean, I certainly, uh, you know, scientifically and logically, you know, swimming is always great for every everything, basically in terms of health and well-being and, and um, pain management, etc. So uh, it's a no-brainer for me that swimming is, would be certainly an activity that you could participate. That even with yeah. a, you know, a you know serious sort of toe joint problem. Um, yeah. Yeah, um, I, I'll pick up on that, Paul. I think one of the things is that it's really important that people realise that actually just water therapy, so actually just going somewhere where you can be in the water and weightless is very helpful. So that's the first thing. If you can swim, that's grand, but you don't necessarily need to. And often at the local pools, there are what are called um, health fitness programs for people who have health issues and they don't make people swim they help people to know how to work work and be active in the water without necessarily causing issues around more pain or problems with their feet so that's the first thing and then the second thing is that it must always be enjoyable and the third thing is that when you go into cold water you have to remember that the brain has sensors that pick up the change in temperature and so heat can be helpful to manage pain, but it's often not thought about actually the fact that being in cold can also help um, um, pain. And it looks as if there is something about people being in cold um, water um, that can help the brain almost in the sense to reboot itself. Um, in terms of the way it manages pain. And I think that's what Louise was highlighting. Uh, Louise, do you want to comment on that one? Um, yeah, actually, it was another another point previously, Francis, in that um, something that's often often said to me is that, uh, well, you, that's great, but you couldn't, you couldn't have been as bad as I am. So it's great that that all worked for you, but it'll never work for me. And I hope that 
that by sharing those slides, it, it shows that I was actually pretty bad. I, I, in fact, I don't believe I'd still be here today if I hadn't made a change. Mm. Um, you know, I, I was dangerously quite poorly. Um, mm. But yes, Francis, the, 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 being in the cold, I can't tolerate cold in any other circumstance. I don't like a cold draft or, or being cold in any other way. But being in the sea is completely different. I absolutely adore it and almost welcome it. It's like a cold cuddle. So this reflects really the whole issue about pain and it is a personal experience for that individual person and that's why almost in a sense every person's experience of it is different and the art of it is to listen to that experience looking potentially for possibilities where actually certainly from a clinician point of view whether they're a psychologist or physiotherapist an occupational therapist or a pharmacist where actually there's possibilities to help the brain and the person to retrain how they manage their pain um, i'm very watchful francis can i just chip in time. just a yep. little point of caution yeah yep. obviously uh you have to be i mean yes water and cold water one thing you have to be very careful of if you're if you're going into cold water make sure you acclimatize yourself to the water before you know don't just jump in and you know because that can lead no. to actually a physiological change that, that can be actually quite dangerous. Yeah. I started in the summer and yeah. then gradually kept going. And, and that's important. You shouldn't yeah, start this time of year. Right. Every, every time you go into the water, you just ease yourself in. Yeah. Because physiologically, if you do it suddenly, you, you can, everything can shut down potentially. Yeah. So you have to be, yeah. you know, yeah. obviously we've and had after drop. There's a, a thing called after drop as well, yeah, isn't there, that yeah, you have to be yeah, very careful of. So it's, it's, you know, your blood pressure can potentially drop quite yeah. drastically. So you just yeah. take it easy, get it, ease yourself into the cold water, and then, then you'll be fine. Yeah. I and I, th I, th I think that's right, Paul. And I think that that, that therefore brings in one of the most fundamental skills um, in, in self-management, which is pacing. Yeah. Um, and actually that you're not 21 and fit as a lop and going to jump into the deep end of a pool or um, into a cold um, water reservoir, but actually you're going to pace it and do it in a kindly, caring way. And that's one of the things that's so crucial in the management of pain is actually beginning to be much more compassionate and supportive of yourself. And that's the sort of conversation that clinicians need to have with people. And that's where I'm looking forward to the work we're going to be doing with um, Balbir Singh and, um, um, and his dance company, because it's about exploring actually how that some of those aspects about being compassionate, which you've heard also from Louise. I'm very mindful of time. Yeah, and oh. as Irene says in the chat, no diving in. That's a good point. No diving in. So there's one last quick question, actually. It's, it's more of a technical question, and, and I actually don't know the answer to this. I mean, I don't know if you guys can chip in. It maybe has never been looked at. I mean, I think as Jess has asked about the percentage of children that suffer from chronic pain, I mean, has ever been explored? Actually, do you know a figure? For... Uh, no, except it's increasing. Um, and um, I can't make any comment off the top of my head. I did know it some years ago, but it was pretty small, but it's very much increasing. Sure, sure. OK. Can, can I add a quick point there, just from an advocate point of view? Yeah. Um, in that I'm hearing um, more and more that actually young people are, are teenagers specifically are suffering a lot with, mm -hmm. with chronic pain and things that are being diagnosed like fibromyalgia. But at the same time, on largely being not fobbed off, that's not a very good um, description, but it's almost being dismissed because of their young age. Sure. Um, and, and that's something to be mindful of, I yeah. think, because, yeah. um, you know, it, it, we know how serious it can become. Yeah, mm. I mean, I think Jess has got in particular, I mean, migraine. I mean, obviously, migraine is a special sort of case. Yeah. That, that's yeah. Quite yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think I just need to say that I've been in, in the job as a, a medical practitioner for well over 40 years. And I can assure you, the amount of pain we're seeing today is not what we saw in the 1970s. 
And I know we're an older aging population and that's contributed to it, but actually chronic pain has grown in all age groups. So there is something seriously going on and it's probably linked to our Western um, lifestyle and, and, and eating patterns as, as being a huge contributing factor. Thanks, Melody, for um, the comment about university students. I would agree there has been increase there too. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I'll, I'll mm. forget that. Um, Francis, shall we? Shall we kick off? Let's go on. Yeah, to yeah, yeah. That would be great. Um, so I think actually it's your turn, Paul. <laughs> um, so let me find your um, slides and uh, bring them up and uh, put them into the. On from. Oops. Put them into the um, uh, slideshow. Okay, so here we, here we go. Okay, so this is following on from Francis's introduction. Yeah, yep, there we go. Helping okay. uh, the GPs, helping the primary care to uh, give them confidence in, uh, in uh, treating and de dealing with people suffering uh, from pain. And uh, now that we are nice of now advocated in April of this year, um, that we um, they have to think in, in, in a different way now, and there'll be less 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 uh, opportunities to actually prescribe the opioids and gabapentinoids, the key key classes, to individuals who are, have come into their, their clinic. I mean, they basically find that after many years, uh, I've realised uh, that based on the evidence that actually these these compounds basically don't work. They work maybe in a a small proportion of individuals in, 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 in a small number of cases, but generally speaking, these drugs do not work for chronic pain. Uh, they, in fact, can make the pain worse and, in fact, can kill you. So it's, it's, you know, it's, it's got to that sort of stage. NICE have finally realised that this is the situation. So they have to now, in the absence of a, of a good rational drug, um, which my actually my lab is working on at the moment but you know we're looking at two three years on so in the meantime we've got to have other ways and better ways of of uh, of, of of helping gps um manage and help other people uh, people suffering pain self-manage their their pain so this is what the this got program was developed and designed for is to uh, if you go to the next slide francis uh so why Develop GOT. So GOT is basically all about giving uh, GPs and pharmacists and anybody that prescribe confidence in talking to their patients, talking to their people that are suffering or living with, with pain, having that conversation and developing strategies to manage, self-manage their pain without necessarily the need of medications. And we we basically put these this this program together and used a, a clinical a practice, a large practice in central Darlington, uh, Clifton Court, uh, which actually has the had the highest level of opioid prescriptions in County Durham. And therefore, uh, if you look at this map, if you can see this little map in the corner, uh, if it's if it's the highest in County Durham, basically it's the highest prescriber in, in the whole of the UK, because in the northeast and Cumbria, we have the highest prescription rates. Uh, in the UK by quite a bit. So this, this was our practice that we, we decided to, to, to work with, and it's a tough one to start with. If, if we can crack this one, we can pretty much crack any practice in the country. Uh, so this was, as I said, this is in the central Darlington. This is, Darlington is a high has a high deprivation score. It has an interesting population crossing um, uh, different spectrums of culture and, and and, then, and financial uh, burdens. Uh, it's the highest prescribed, as I said, in, within County Durham and therefore in the, in the Northeast. Uh, and they were basically, you know, patients were using large numbers of drugs. Polypharmacy was, was rife and still is uh, and in, t in, treating, in treating pain. So next slide, please, Francis. So this is the program. This is the 10 footsteps that Francis as mentioned, uh, very briefly, it's a set of steps that um, we, uh, the, the clinician uses to take the individual living with pain 
through their through their journey. So it's building knowledge about pain, it's acceptance from the individual that they don't cure their pain, but they'll be able to maybe maybe you know, manage their pain over time. It's, it includes pacing, as which is Francis has mentioned a lot uh, so far. Setting goals, getting active again. Louise highlighted that it's very important. Getting active, managing moods again is a fundamental part of managing pain because pain is not just a physical thing. It's a it's a it's a it's an emotional state as well. Sleep is one of those those cornerstone um, phenomena. Sleep is fundamentally important for you um, in terms of your memory processing, in terms of your emotional state, and in terms of managing your pain. So sleep is, is a really big step uh, in, in a lot of this. And food relationships and work is another step, thinking about your nutrition, your food intake of relationships, obviously socially. Uh, your work obviously is a high pressure um, phenomena that uh, again can affect how you how you manage your pain relaxation and mindfulness step nine and very important to bear in mind you know this is not straightforward program managing setbacks and how you manage setbacks and the strategies to manage setbacks so the toolbox is designed the 10 footsteps is designed for both clinicians because to, to educate them and give them confidence in delivering a service and also the 10 footsteps is geared towards the patients themselves to be able to step by step take them through their journey uh, as again Louise explained with her journey there's a series of you know many of these things highlighted in, in the footsteps came out of Louise's experience and people like her so it's to give clinicians confidence patients confidence and very importantly because you know medications and prescribing is still a part of managing pain safe prescribing so it's building confidence so it's it, the program was developed uh, a series of training uh, sessions, health coaching, face-to-face uh, -face online sessions, educating and uh, training uh, the GPs to give, again, like I said, give them confidence in being able to manage their patients' pain. So a shift from a biomedical to a biopsychosocial approach. That's the fancy name for it. It's a bit of biology, which is what I do most of the time. Bit of psychology and a bit of sociology. So it's a combination of those three aspects that that you need to to be able to manage pain, and facilitate uh, the management of pain. Next slide, please. Francis, yep, uh, yeah. So it's it's basically we develop this within the practice. It needs to be a systematic, person-centered pain management process. Uh, again, like I said, they keep banging on about the confidence. It's building patients' confidence and, and very importantly, GP confidence, because their, their confidence up until, you know, the last couple of years are really a rock bottom. Um, you know, they don't, you know, they really don't, didn't have a, a good idea of how to, how to deal with this. And now NICE have thrown on to them that they can't actually give medications. That's not, you know, the answer. You can't just sign up. A shit and, get, and send you away. Now they actually are forced to having to have those conversations and, and, and taking this approach. Okay, next slide, please. Okay, so the, 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 so I'm a sign I'm a scientist. So results. This is this is the results. The early you know the early results of our program. This got program. So we introduced this program to this practice, and we assessed in the first place how the confidence of the gps had improved okay so this is this is again you don't need to necessarily be able to read around the outsides of the of the uh, this spider chart but if you look at the the, the, the dots and the, and the circle the closer to the center the, the circle is the least confident the, pay, the the gps were basically so there's various series of questions we asked them at the beginning of the program which gauge how confident they are. And you can see the, the answers are quite, you know, the circle is quite small. And over time, over a year of, of the GOT program, you can see even by eye, you know, the size of the, the circle has increased. In other words, they've got more and more confident, the more the, uh, they've got confident in delivering 
uh, pain management service, the bigger, the bigger circle. So that's significant effects for many of these, these questions we asked the individuals has, has improved this, um, the process. Okay, so that's the first thing. That was a, our you know, first goal was to start to improve the confidence of the GPs. Next slide, please. So how does that affect the prescription rates? Okay, so this is uh, a few graphs here. And again, you, if you look at the top graph first, this is looking at Clifton Court, which is our test practice, comparing it to the average prescription rate in the, in the CCG. So that's the regional um, GPs, uh, sorry, regional practices in the area where Clifton sits, and then there's England, okay? So if you follow Clifton Court, that's the easy one to follow, that's the red one. So he starts very high, and you can see, as we go into the program, which is the blue line going across, you can see is a ra very rapid and significant drop in the high dose opioid prescription rate, okay? These are the ones we focused on early on, because these are the ones at most, in most danger because these are the 200 mg equivalent morphine uh, opioid doses. So the, you know, these can potentially kill you, you know, over, over a period of time. So these are the ones we focus on. You can see we've got those down, right down. So now I think we're down at two or three left in the practice that are on the high dose and they are coming off very soon. Compared to NHS uh, CCG, which is the blue line, which hasn't, you know, so it's basically going down, but it's, relatively flat and, and England as well. So you can see a really dramatic effect of our program. And again, the two, two um, graphs shows you gabapentinoids, which are the other class of drugs. Again, pregabalin and, and gabapentin. Again, you can see a very significant drop in high dose gabapentin and pregabalin in these, in these graphs. Next slide, please, Francis. And just to re-emphasize re this, this is a bit more of a this is the graph that's probably going to go into the paper, so it's a little bit more uh, elegant. Uh, so again, it's, it's showing you the same sort of uh, idea. So this the GUP program started with that first dotted line where it starts, and you can see this is basically all the gabapentinoids sort of lumped together, looking at the reduction in gabapentinoid prescription in Clifton Court over time. So GUP started with the first dot, the GP training started with the second dotted line, and you can see after that, again, you can see a significant drop in prescription rates for gabapentinoids. What we've got on this slide, just sorry. Sorry. Just, yeah, just, just to highlight, actually, we, I highlighted where the national lockdowns were. So this is despite COVID, okay? We've done this despite COVID. This ran over the COVID period, despite COVID, and those were the three lockdowns we've got a significant drop in gabapentinoids, but more dramatically, if you look at the opioid situation, the high dose opioids, again, you can see really dramatic drop, particularly after the training started down to now, as I said, we've probably got about a couple of patients left in the practice on high dose. Um, and that, that will go down to one, I think in the next month or so, maybe zero. Okay, so we've gone, We've, we've had this very dramatic effect despite COVID. Next slide, please. I think I'm pretty much finished. So summary, what we've done with the GOT program just on a year's um, work um, and is all now in place basically to be taken on board potentially by any practice in the country. There's resources are there, all free and freely available and actually most of the resources are available through the websites that Francis talked about earlier. Increased confidence of clinician, knowledge, skills, and tools. Basically, GPs, oh, sorry, medics get five minutes on pain in their medical degree, okay? For something that basically affects 34% of people in the country, it's, it's, it's just scary, basically, okay? So they get five minutes on pain. So we, you know, it's not surprising they don't have the knowledge or skills or confidence to, to manage pain. Reduction of high dose pain medication and total gabapentinoids. I've shown you the data. Uh, systematic approach to pain management and medication use. So this is what we achieved in a very short period of time with some amazing people, including Francis, obviously, and uh, a number of others, including Becky Kinchin at the practice, who was the real champion within the practice. 
she went above and beyond really to to get this done uh, for her practice. So that's that's that summarizes where we are, and obviously we want to take this forward. And we are up for just a highlight, just a bit of flag waving. We are up for an award tomorrow night for this uh, for for uh, for the uh, AHSN. Uh, was it bright bright uh, spark? Bright ideas. Bright ideas. Uh, health award. Uh, we'll see. We'll see if we get it. See if pains. Uh, <laughs> important in the NHS. <laughs> anyway, that's that's me done. Great, uh, great, great, Paul. Um, and um, yes, pain um, is not something that people like. So um, who knows what happens tomorrow? But uh, a, fab a fabulous piece of work with people coming together from different um, 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 areas to um, uh, make sense of self-management, make sense of how it, we might support clinicians in primary care to actually have different conversations and engage with people so that they have the offer opportunity to have a different journey. And already I'm picking up in the chat, you know, people aren't getting access just even to an annual review of actually where they are with their health and their pain. Um, and if nothing else could happen, if that could happen for all people with pain in this country, um, that could make a huge shift. Um, so that's very helpful, Paul. Um, and it, it's time now with our remaining time to spend a few, few two or three minutes, uh, five minutes on, on um, some questions and some comments, and then going to hand over to, um, uh, Chris Pennington, who's going to share with us a new approach to um, reaching out to people with pain, because we've got to be creative, because the traditional approaches aren't working. Okay, you've heard about some already, but actually new approaches, particularly coming from ideas coming from people with pain, is the direction of travel that could make a difference. And then Balbir Singh is going to share very much about um, uh, a new project funded by the Arts Council is going to um, look at with respect to pain. So um, some questions that Paul, Chris, I and Louise can um, address. Anything that people want to comment or question about at this point? There's some positive, obviously, responses. I, I love that it's been talked about in the chat about the importance of peer support. Um, and we we just had a, a session on that at the festival recently, um, which we'll, we'll tell you more about shortly. Uh, but yeah, peer support is extremely important. And I'm not talking about some of these Facebook groups that are, are really quite, <laughs> quite awful. Um, but uh, seek out some some proper peer support. Um, and if you know of a peer support group um, and you're a clinician, please flag that up to people because there is great value in people being able to share their experience. And often they don't talk about their pain. They, they just enjoy being with someone else who gets them. Um, and I can't and I can't tell you, you know, how important that is. Yeah. Um, I would echo that, um, Louise, really, really important. But the, some of the Facebook groups are toxic. And I think people need to be aware of that. So if people are struggling then um, to certainly highlight um, 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 that they may be engaged in an unhelpful, toxic uh, social media group. Yeah, and the importance of carers as well, which is something we've considered quite significant in, the, in this programme, basically not just the people living with pain, it's the, it's the carers and the family members and the support groups are also important and we're, we're trying to help them as well to... to, to That's a really important point, Paul. And, mm. and you know, I'd, I'd go on to say that, that I think too often the, the carer or caregiver is, is overlooked entirely, even by themselves. Mm. Um, for instance, my wife, Karen, um, didn't acknowledge for a second that she was a carer. Um, and when she was asked by the clinical nurse specialist that I was seeing um, if she needed any help or support, she, she thought that was a ridiculous question at first. But it wasn't until I came off opioids and she lost her role that she completely fell apart and, and had a, a bit of a breakdown and needed, um, needed some talking therapy herself. So yeah, I, I, would, 
I, where possible, I would always recommend people take somebody with them to their appointments and that the clinician involved um, really considers what it's like for that person too. Um, I think it's really important almost not just to treat the person, but to treat treat the, the couple or the family even, if possible. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, I think I've got a question from Jess. I think she's got a hand up. Yeah, hi, yeah. Um, yeah, I was just, I just wanted to say, like, look, yeah, you were saying about the Facebook groups was, like, there is, for me, because... I'm more sort of, I'm supporting my son who's going through, you know, chronic pain daily. And I found this one parent on a Facebook group. Um, but what it means to actually just to be able to go, do you know what I mean? And they do. And for me, as like Louise says, you know, you are a carer. Um, it's just in a different, it's just in a different way, isn't it? I suppose. Um, but yeah, and it was just, you know, it's just a message of, yeah. I suppose, just asking for help, you know, where you can. Yeah. 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 We'll see when we talk about the festival, Chris is going to talk about the festival, yeah. there are elements within the festival that are suited towards care, you know, of, towards the carer community as well as, as the people yeah. living in pain as well. So, yeah. so Jess, you, you should look at, you know, you should look at that if you haven't already. You know, have a look at this festival. I think Chris is going to talk about it now. I think. Yeah, yeah, but that, that sounds very timely, and thanks, Jess. Um, it, it, uh, it very welcome contribution, um, particularly from from a mother of a of, of a young person, um, with that that struggling journey. Um, but let's open up things to some positive possibilities, which Chris is going to share with us. Um, when um, uh, clinicians and um, people with lived experience came together as a co-production to reach out to people with pain and their carers. So I'll share the screen, Chris, and hand over to you. Great, thanks, Francis. Okay, so um, I want to talk about, um, actually kind of starting from my perspective, my story, um, but what we've been doing over the last year um, in terms of the Footsteps Festival. Um, which is that uh, you see a representation um, in that picture. Um, it's just that uh, which is just um, a lovely online festival, very accessible. We hope um, that is there available for um, for people to um, to help each other and support each other um, with persistent pain. If I can have the next slide, please. Yep. So coming at this from my angle. Um, for a long time now, um, I worked in a pain clinic. I worked in a general pain clinic for 17 years. And then for the last four years, I've been working specifically with people with orofacial pain. Um, and so most of the patients who I've worked with have had pain for years and years. Um, and this pain was affecting every aspect of their lives. Um, and there was a very strong belief, not just um, amongst the doctors, not just amongst the, the physiotherapists, the people that were coming to see us, but pretty much everybody. Um, there was a very strong belief in biomedical causes of pain and a search for interventions that would influence this. And I think still when pain gets very intense, it's very hard to kind of get away from that belief. It's like a very strong magnet that we that we all get pulled back to. Um, so possibly like Louise at the time, a lot of these people will be taking multiple medications, but would still be experiencing pain, not very high quality of life. And even despite having been experiencing pain for years and years and years, many of these people had never been introduced to self-management. They, they wouldn't know the words. They, they wouldn't... Um, and, and they wouldn't have an idea that there would be things that they could do that would be helpful themselves. Or if they did think that there were things that they could do, they would think of them very much as ways of coping with the pain, that you can't do anything about the pain itself, but you might be able to, to cope with it a little bit better. Um, now, a lot of these people who would come to see me would have lots of coping strategies. Um, they were very, you know, a lot of these people, they're very active problem solvers. They're really go-getting kind of people. 
But often the problem was these coping strategies are not a good fit for pain. And just as an example of that kind of thing, what a lot of people try to do is just get on with their life and kind of ignore the pain or push it to the back of their mind, tell themselves it can't be all that bad, force themselves to absolutely do as much as they can. And unfortunately, that is not a very good fit for persistent pain. It can um, actually kind of feed a cycle of pain if, if you're not careful. So it wasn't that people were, were passive and not trying, maybe the opposite, maybe they were trying too hard sometimes. So then if we can have the next slide. Um, so then in this pain clinic, um, we could offer psychology sessions. Um, we had a pain management program that we would offer. Um, I also used to run a, a mindfulness and compassion group that was well received and people used to come along either to individual sessions or these groups. And mostly, therefore, people would get up to eight sessions. So if they were seen individually, they'd get up to one hour. If they were seen in a group, they'd get two hours. And after that, the very strong service expectation was that the patient would be discharged and they would then be left to continue on their own with the information that they'd learned, which perhaps doesn't seem very much when you've been living with pain for a long time and it's very severe and very intense. And a lot of the patients who came through our service really didn't feel ready to be discharged at that point. And it really brought up questions such as, where do you access ongoing support? You've had eight weeks, that's a good start. You can really change the way you think and develop some helpful habits, but it's only a good start. It's nothing more than that. But so where, where do you get your ongoing support? And if you have developed some new habits that are helpful, how do you keep them up? Especially when you're not getting that weekly contact, maybe in a group with other people who are also developing those habits and supporting each other, cheering each other on. How do you keep it up when you go back into your context and your family doesn't really know much about what you've been learning and people expect you to be what you've been before? Um, how do you do that? And if you have a setback, what is there to help you get through setbacks? Um, so I think I would say that, you know, pain clinics, they can be great, but even if you do get access to a pain clinic, which not everybody does, it's limited how much it can help you. On its own, it's not going to be the full answer. So if we can go to the next slide, please. Um, and then we came to lockdown. Um, and during lockdown, if, um, if access to pain services is difficult generally, during lockdown, access to pain services was really, really restricted. A lot of pain management services temporarily closed. Um, in some areas of the country, all the staff in pain clinics would then go and um, they'd be allocated to, uh, to working on the general wards in the hospital to try to relieve nurses, to help with COVID. Um, it was a massive change lockdown. Things changed for everybody, I think, and there was a reduced opportunity for everybody to, um, to, to actually engage in pain management. And so even more than before, perhaps, there was this sense of what is there to support people to manage their pain now? Next slide, please. And then just out of the blue, um, on um, a social media platform, which I won't mention the name of, um, <laughs> the, um, this, uh, this wonderful person wrote on Twitter, Would anybody, does anybody want to join an online meeting to think about how to support people living with pain during this lockdown period? Um, and so, uh, so I, along with, uh, with, with several other people, I think we had 50 people initially coming to, uh, to meet. We literally all responded to this query on Twitter. We got together, we had a Zoom meeting. We just started talking about what we could do and, and what would be helpful. Um, which just felt great to me because there was, um, I was there as a psychologist, there was physiotherapists there, there were people who were living with pain, there were, there were people with experience of pain from all different angles coming to that meeting. Next slide, please. And from that meeting was born the Footsteps Festival or what became the Footsteps Festival. We had a little bit of time talking about what we were going to do, what we were um, 
what, what we were going to develop, I think at first we thought, well, wouldn't it be great if there was like a kind of cafe, like a like a pain cafe, and you could come once a week, you could come and you could chat to people and you could you could connect and, and you could see how you how you were getting on. And then we started to talk about different events that um, that could be helpful. We started to um, to talk about online different things that we could do. And um, so these pictures, um, we've all been um, involved in, in, in the Footsteps Festival. Um, we probably have um, have had I've, I've only I think had a, a small input compared to uh, particularly um, Louise and Nikki, who've been absolutely um, driving this forward. But everybody's got involved. It hasn't mattered if we've been professionals or we've been patients. We've all pulled together um, and we've brought together this online resource, which is running this year and we hope will carry on, which is called the Footsteps Festival 2021. We can have the next page, please. Um, so again, here on the left, this is the uh, this is the festival. If you go to the Footsteps Festival page, which you can get to by going to My Live Well with Pain, and it's accessed through there. There's a, a tab called Footsteps Festival. You see that lovely festival. Um, it's not uh, we're not really in a field hugging a tree, unfortunately. Although I think some of us hope that maybe one day we uh, we could be. Um, but we want that festival feel because pain, for sure it's a serious business, but it doesn't help too much to take it seriously. Um, by which I mean, it doesn't help too much if we lose that kind of creativity and joy and wanting to explore things that you might get in a festival. So we wanted very much to have a festival feel that this wasn't all about getting rid of the bad. This was actually about engaging in the good and really balancing the um, the the the, um, the brain in pain by adding loads and loads of good things as well as trying to to deal with um, with stress and things that we know are, um, are unhelpful to pain. Um, and we've just put on loads and loads of events. And, and here again is just a few examples, and hopefully you can see the range of different things that we've put on. So one of our um, most popular sessions has been by Opera Noor, who've done Step Into Singing, who've come on in, um, they're, they're in the third of their courses now, and they just support people to sing at their computer, um, and people absolutely love it, and it's a little bit of joy, but also the breathing exercises that you do are really helpful for pain, and you're engaging with something that's very positive, and it's really helpful. You hear, hey, see here, we've got um, some origami. We had a pet show and tell because our animals are so important to us, aren't they? We've had mindfulness courses. Irene Tracy is a very well-known um, professor of pain. Imagine having that title, professor of pain at Oxford University. Um, she's, uh, she's a neuroscientist. She's been on more than once to uh, give talks and give us the benefit of her, um, her expertise. Yes, the Queen of Pain, as, as Paul says there. Um, we've had more low key talks. We had more low key sessions talking about pain. And this is just a small amount of the, of the things that, that we've put on. If we can go to the next slide, please. So the key features of this is that all of our events are co-produced. All of them have been involved with one of our member, uh, one of our lived experience volunteer teams, um, along with them, um, or sometimes, sometimes entirely lived experience, but very often along with a professional person as well. Um, the content is, uh, there's lots of live content, so it's engaging and people can come along and people can join in, but we've tried to record as much as we can as well. So on the festival site, people can access recordings and we're very aware that people have varying abilities to actually concentrate and stay with a um, stay with a session so we like to have it recorded and available to access maybe in small bits later on if that works better very much trusted presented and resources we want to um, absolutely make sure that people can be confident that it's scientifically based that it's um absolutely kind of um you, you don't um, you don't need to question the um, the evidence that you're getting from us. A wide range of topics, and very importantly, it's free at the point of use. 
which I think we're all really, really proud of because we have not had a penny of funding for this initiative. We've put into it our own time. Um, we've had um, assistance from um, Live Well With Pain in terms of the, um, the web resources and helping us to, to develop the, the access, um, the, um, the, the money for the web developer and such like. Um, and very, very importantly, we want this to be fun because far as well as reducing stress is important, actually increasing fun, increasing enjoyment, that's as good a balance. If you, you can't reduce stress down to nothing, but you can make it have less of an impact if you've got the fun and the interest and the curiosity and all those positive emotions going on at the same time. Next slide, please. So these are just three courses that we've run. We've, um, we've done um, two mindfulness-based stress reduction courses. Those are eight-week courses. We've done a pain management, self-management course based on the 10 footsteps, which I'll talk a little bit more about. And we've done step into singing, which I did mention briefly. If we can move on. Um, so the 10 footsteps course, um, our aim with the 10 footsteps course was to co-create a self-management support program um, using the, the trusted resource of the 10 footsteps, which um, we've talked about already in this session. Um, and this was something we really wanted to develop in an accessible format. So we made it online. It was free to access. And unlike pain management services, we didn't limit this at all. We didn't limit by number of people that could attend because with the internet, you really don't have those room capacity requirements. And we didn't require people to go through an assessment beforehand. The only criteria that we had for accepting people on the course was that they thought it might be useful for them. Um, we also recorded most of the sessions. We intended, well, we recorded them all, but we, we weren't able to, um, to make them all available, unfortunately, because of confidentiality when we were sometimes having discussions on the screen, um, although we thought that was a very helpful um, thing to do. It did unfortunately limit our ability to then post that publicly. Um, and also very importantly, we were talking about these self-management things. Every single session had, um, we had lived experience people. We had Jenny and Mark who were absolutely crucial in, um, in helping to, uh, to deliver the materials um, and develop the materials. Um, we also had myself, Francis was involved, Rosie, a physiotherapist, so we had the entire multidisciplinary team and patients, and it was supported by other live and recorded events. So we have a coffee and chat, and we still have a coffee and chat on the Footsteps Festival every week where people can come along and chat to some of our lived experience volunteers, and during the Footsteps Festival, people could go along and talk about some of the things that they'd learned in self-management and what they were trying out if they wanted to. Next slide, please. These very briefly are the sessions and you can see that they speak to the footsteps that are part of the 10 Footsteps program on the website. So we started with pain in the brain. Very importantly, understanding the possibilities. When you understand that pain does come from the brain, and it's not a fixed response to a certain amount of physical damage, then the possibilities open up that there's really something you can do that's going to help in that. We looked at goal setting, pacing, getting active, acceptance. Well, somebody said acceptance is difficult. Yes, acceptance is difficult. So we wanted to wait till halfway through the program before we tackled that one. Um, anxious mood, low mood, how, how to deal with setbacks, sleep and relationships setback plans and being kind to ourselves. So this is the content that we delivered and it all linked back to the materials that people could access in the 10 Footsteps programme. And we tried to have a mix between presenting and actually being quite informal, talking, uh, because there was quite a few of us on the call, some of us were able to chat while others were presenting. So we had the, the chat going as well um, and really kept the, the engagement, but we did use pacing breaks um, so we weren't kind of talking for more than 20 25 minutes without taking a break next yeah um and we got really some um some pretty good feedback from that some people really liked this they found it helpful 
Um, a couple of really nice bits of feedback we got there. It exceeded my expectations. The level of information and support was phenomenal. There was great activities and I enjoyed participating. It was lovely to take part in group activities. However, we did also have feedback from people who found that it didn't entirely meet their needs. There was a sense, for example, that somebody said, I felt a failure because I take painkillers and everybody seemed to preach that they're not needed and pain can be managed. Um, and we really try to take the, the approach that everybody's individual and at different stages in the journal that journey um, and everybody has to find their own path. Um, but maybe we didn't communicate that as, as well as we, we possibly could. If we could move to the next slide, please. Um, in terms of um, what people were looking for and how people did feel that they benefited, we did a little bit of research as well. Um, and we found that um, the central theme was about living well with pain. If you can live well with your pain, then you're setting yourself up actually for that gradual improvement that Louise was talking about that doesn't happen straight away. Um, now, in terms of living well with pain, um, some people talked about taking back control and increasing their confidence, um, about there being a reduced impact of the pain on their life and about the quality of their life improving. And people felt that in order to access that, they needed the tools and the skills. Uh, they benefited from expert guidance. It was really, really important to understand pain, to understand pain science, but also changing the perspective, just changing the way people thought about things individually. They felt that was important. The sense of trust and community that you got from being in a group and being able to talk about these things was very important to people and almost giving themselves permission to self-care. And I think this is another really important issue because people who have pain often don't give themselves permission to self-care because they're so busy worrying about being a burden and all the things that they're not doing that they actually um, they forget about themselves quite easily. So that was a really important, li linking in with what Francis is saying about being kind to yourself, the self-care was a really important part of it. So going back to the festival itself, I'm going to now pass over to Louise, if that's okay, just to give a highlight um, of some of the other things over the year that we've been uh, that we've been offering on the festival. Yeah, thanks, um, Chris. That was a, a really good rundown of of what's happened. Um, and and before I I go on any more, I just want to say that that we are always always open to other people getting involved, whether that be um, clinician or person living with pain. Um, you know, we're all volunteers, and one of our one of our main um, one of the, the things we've said right from the start is that this should be accessible to everyone. Um, and, and people living with pain have got um, uh, variable capacity. So we wanted people to feel that they could get involved and not be committed. So if you have only got um, a couple of hours here and there and you don't know that you're gonna have a couple of hours next month, that doesn't matter. If you, if you want to come and get involved and do what you feel you can do, that's fantastic and we welcome you and you never have to give us an explanation of why you need to step back um, just let someone know and, and that's fine um, and that goes for everybody we want this to be a, for everyone to be able to contribute to and we've been lucky we've had some really lovely contributions from people um, and Chris has highlighted some of the the the, the really big ones um, like Irene Tracy, we were so thrilled to have her come and, and present. Um, and you can find, all, I've put in the chat, you can find all our past events um, and go back and see the ones that have been recorded. Some of them aren't recorded. Some of the ones that are more interactive aren't recorded for, for obvious reasons. Um, but uh, I, I'd encourage everyone to, to take a look and see what's on. And if you think there is something that we haven't covered that you would find really useful, um, feel free to, to drop us a line. I'll put our email address in, in there again in a minute, but it is also on, on the web page. And, um, and I also want to take this opportunity to, to thank Francis and, and um, Live Well for allowing us to um, piggyback on their website to start with, because it was really taking a bit of a punt. 
um, you know, we didn't know where this was going to go. And actually, it's taken off fantastically and we've had huge support. Um, and, and from the Physiotherapy Pain Association as well, as well as Durham and the Wolfson Institute, it's all been fantastic. Um, so yeah, I, and you can just see from that list for yourself, I don't, I don't think I really need to go through it all, but um, it, it's just all been fantastic. Um, what we could do with is for more people, for it to reach more people that aren't necessarily um, looking at Twitter or Facebook, um, so if you know someone that you think that this could help, please pass on the details. Um, because some of the, as Chris has already mentioned, some of the feedback we've had, um, you know, we've, we've had messages where people have said it, it's, it, the resources have literally changed their life. Um, the step into singing, for instance, um, I, I, it's, yeah, it's just all been really, really good. And where we've been, where it's been pointed out to us that something actually hasn't quite hit the mark, we've tried our best um, to address that and, and learn from what hasn't worked. Um, but going into next year, we hope to carry on and we really could do with more help. So any ideas, please let us know. Do you want to, is there another slide, Chris? Yeah, I think we need. I think I think we need to whiz through them quite quickly um, because we're kind of running a little bit behind time. So, so, so I think um, just really want to kind of say that you know we've had really quite good engagement. We've had loads of numbers, but at the same time, in the chat, we'd like ideas about how we can get more engagement, please, um, because it's um, yeah really popular. Lots of ideas, but we we kind of need more. Um, so if you you want to come along if you want to signpost people to it um that would be absolutely brilliant as well um, and we are going to be continuing in a slightly uh, reduced down version because we have to pace ourselves as well um to to carry on things into um, into next year as well now i am aware um francis that uh, that we've been overrunning so i'm going to end my bit there and um, and let you introduce the next bit okay that's great so um Thank you very much, Chris and Louise, for that introduction to the festival. I'm sure now you've got a really good idea of uh, what's been happening um, and uh, keep your eyes peeled for next year. Um, I'm just going to move us on because I'm very much um, about helping um, us to take things into a different domain um, and um, very much wanting to ask Belbia Singh from the Belbia sing dance company to join us for the last remaining minutes that we've got um, to share about unmasking pain um, which is a project that has been supported by the arts council england um, to explore actually what is going on in with people whose lives are affected with persistent pain so could i ask malbia to join us now Hi, hello, Fran Francis. Yes, I'm here. Hi, Balbir. Hi, hi. Welcome, welcome. And um, please um, kind of share with us a little bit about this new project, which is on the horizon um, now, along with the festival, along with all these other areas that we've talked about and shared about self-management. Great, lovely. So I'll, I'll speak quickly. The fascinating hearing everything, and thank you to Francis and Paul for inviting myself and Dawn Fuller and, and Emma Tregden from Space Two, the producers of the project. So just a little bit of background first of all. My designer David Andrassi was match maker between myself and Francis, who has also done the Footsteps website, and so he worked with me for over a decade, and I was worked with Francis for a long time. He, mentioned Francis's name a few years ago and we found the right opportunity to come together and the we it's an arts council funded project as Francis said so it's an approach from from an artistic perspective with an with a arts organization in the arts council's national portfolio just a little bit of background with where we are coming from as, as an arts uh, organization there's we, I, I, I can see the ideas and make the work. It's about celebrating the human condition and making sense of the world around us and loosely four strands to the company's work, support and art, 
uh, work, began in 2012 with working with synchronized swimmers, just referencing and, and the, the point someone was making earlier about water uh, and then swimming and its healing benefits and properties. So, and then I went on from that to make other work in swimming pools for audiences. And then from there, we made a couple of shows on ice rinks, just referencing cold. And what was interesting with that was gradually being on an, uh, an ice rink through the day, it, the cold just seeps through the floor into your bones. But there is something quite rejuvenating about that process and rebooting at the same time in terms of the environment and things around us. So spot and art is one strand of work. Another strand of work is classical revisited. We have uh, classical Indian dance styles and classical Indian music are at the heart of a lot of what we do. And they have healing properties as art forms uh, and the approach to them and the, 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 in the spiritual way. And dancers go on to have very long careers uh, in them as well. So there's, there's a whole aspect of the importance of them in terms of just healing uh, in, in, in many ways. Uh, as such so we but we take classical indian dance and we place them in new settings and in different different ways rather than just stick with the, the traditional work as such another strand is an appetite for dance engaging new audiences and audiences from different settings we're currently touring a piece on the rural touring circuit called love and spice which is about spices and their healing benefits and properties uh and, and good food and then the fourth strand is celebrating age working with performers we're making a work uh, premiering next month with septuagenary uh, and also a potting cast as such so loosely flop four strands of work we made a lot of work uh, with swimming pools ice rinks the in, with around the theme of sport with rugby uh, as well and performed in libraries we've also worked with sheffield uh, university of sheffield and Krebs Fest around the work of sir hans Krebs and the, the citric acid cycle working with the scientists there so that loosely gives a sense of background. We kind of zigzag all over the place and we like to be challenged. I like to be challenged and find new opportunities and ways of connecting with the art form, with audiences and also partnership building, uh, which we've done quite extensively and also with a lot of the, the leisure sector in terms of taking a, a swimming pool theatrical production to swimming pools and working with leisure centres who had no understanding of dance and no understanding of multicultural dance, but even to get them uh, and engaging effectively. That's the background with where we, we talk about challenge uh, making sense of things around us. And the idea for this then very briefly came, we did a production not so long back called The Two Feeders uh, around Frida Kahlo and her Indian equivalent Amrita Sher Gill. Both existed at the same time but never met. And Fr Amrita Sher Gill was called the Frida Kahlo of India. And, and if you look up artists suffering chronic pain, Frida Kahlo is very high up the list. Uh, with, with that. So there was, was an interesting element of, of exploring her identity and who she was and, and how she made sense of the world around her through, through her art. So th this idea came through a lot of research that we did with David putting us together and Dawn led on the writing of the bid and his producer was based on this project. Uh, we had lots of conversations with Paul, uh, with also with Leeds Beckett University and Francis and, and David to kind of work up the ideas. And I'll get, uh, if we have time, Dawn, just to talk a little bit about that process and the learning for her. So whilst there's been interventions and engagement with using the arts to uh, parlor and, and support people suffering or living with chronic pain, the, there's, I didn't find anything out there research quite extensively, a, a holistic to it, uh, and, uh, quite a lot of research around it. And what was interesting was Francis was saying uh, people want to tell their story uh, and articulate it and be heard and be heard by GPs and time is very limited. And I began looking into that and I also thought, okay, well, how are, what are the different approaches people can understand what their story and is? is the most effective vocabulary to articulate that and what is the process before they actually tell the story. So the, this idea of unmaking pain brings together a number of artists in the, uh, and an important two-way collaboration because it's about the artist learning from the subject matter and, and the people involved uh, as, as well as kind of uh, using their art forms to engage collaboratively. And, and so it's about having a, a number of artists. One is a mask maker and create a mask with, with, artists, with participants externally what is the outside perception for the world but on what is the internal aspect of actually what's found in terms of mask and hopefully we're at the end of the uh, of this 
here as a pilot uh, to guide to an avid extending this much further and then hopefully there's a difference in what those masks are in terms of what do we what do we what do we present to the world and what do we actually feel so there's a mask maker on board there's indian dance there's two artists who suffer chronic pain themselves and we've been going through the process with one of the dancers to get them to articulate and the in a semi abstract way what their experience with pain is what's the rhythm of the speed of it where is it how does it translate through the body and i'll say that through movement very much now movement so it's about this vocabulary and the idea of this project is to partner artists with individuals and for the artist to be their vocabulary and a way of articulating their pain uh, and them seeing the pain outside of themselves we have a clay maker sculptor on board as well in terms of looking at sculpting what that pain is and having that conversation with the pain outside of yourself we know we can't we can't cure the pain but we can find different approaches to help individuals understand and relate and process and, and talk about and, and have these tools of artists around them to articulate it and similarly have music on board ways in terms of that vocabulary to engage with it. And then over this pro, and in one sense, it's about distraction from it in itself as well, right? uh, and, and to think about other things and not necessarily be the subject matter as such and to help individuals get help and identity and a different relation with the pain uh, in a positive I was talking about earlier uh, as well and then towards the end of that project is bringing the artists together to then work co-deliver with somebody new coming into that process uh, as well so that's it's much more complex than that uh, and there's lots of support from Francis and Paul and other partners as well uh, and to use this as a, a pilot. I don't know Dawn if you want to quickly articulate a little something. Well as I, as I was only like two minutes left what I would just like to say if people want more information or if there are clinicians who think um, that they have patients who might be interested or benefit from the project or people on here who are living with pain. Um, we are um, recruiting participants for the project um, over throughout December. Um, and I can tell you a bit more about the, the commitment um, that, that is needed for that. Um, there'll be five collab days, there'll be short days um, and they, there will be breaks. I think one of the things that Balbir was alluding to that this has been a massive learning curve for us. Um, uh, so certainly for me. So, you know, as we were creating the bid, I was having to rewrite um, and really understand, you know, how the, the, the creative process would be, um, have to be adapted in, in order to, um, you know, respond to the, the potential different needs in the room. Um, so, um, Sorry, I've got dis got distracted. Yes, there are five collab days. We are looking at um, some online support as well in between those. Sorry. In between, in between the collab days with the artists, very much taking a co-production co approach. Um, so everybody in the room will, um, their opinion um, and suggestions will be treated equally. Um, we are working towards a site-specific installation that will have a performance element. Um, participants can make up their own mind if they want to perform or not. Um, that it might that might just be through film or it might just be something that is um, contributed to the installation. There, there's no pressure around the performance at all. Um, and I'm just about to share my email in the chat so if anybody wants more information or wants to have a conversation then just email me and um we can take it from there and just to add to that <laughs> first, as well as the collabs there'll be satellite activity as well as part of the recruitment and the artists are spread out through the country one's based in devon the a few of us based in yorkshire and, and and some further afield and so it's an unknown for us it's an exciting collaboration to bring how do we can bring the arts uh and and the health sector together so a lot of what we about funding and engaging and funding ourselves and to go on this journey and this learning thank you so uh, 
absolutely um, wonderful to hear some creativity, um, some different ways of looking and thinking at this common problem of humanity, um, which is global, which is in the UK, which is in our street, which is in our homes um, and involves everybody. Um, and um, I just think that probably from what we presented tonight with Balbeer and Dawn kind of rounding up with some new directions of travel, um, we've had a fabulous evening. Uh, we've heard a lot. Uh, and if we'd had a little bit more time, we could have worked and chatted a little bit more um, with yourselves. So forgive us for that. But I think what comes to me at the end of all of this is the importance of coming to terms with the concept of being compassionate at all levels within yourself, within um, the person um, for the person who has the pain for the person who has the pain with themselves and to look for the rich opportunities that are there to actually reshape a different life journey it's possible um i'd like to thank chris louise paul balbia and dawn for coming and sharing today and for all of you being so fabulous in putting things into the chat and bearing with us as we did a hopscotch journey through self-management and helping people to live a better life despite their pain. Thank you very much for being with us. Just to, just to finish off also, uh, just to reiterate, this is, has been recorded and we will be potentially putting this together for uh, attaching to the festival site. Um, and uh, so what's this space on, on all the you know the number of projects that we've we've highlighted during this during this during this event uh, hopefully you've enjoyed it thank you very much for your interactions and your questions it's been really really good from our side as well because again you, you get all your best experiments from talking to people living with the, the problems is <laughs> what I tell my students so uh, thank you to everybody and have a good evening and uh, talk to you soon but we will carry on and we will have more events like this in the future so watch this space thank you thank you balbia thank you dawn thank you chris louise and paul and, yeah. and good night and good night